Well, what is up, Seacoast Online family? So excited to be back with you. Pastor Ryan Hello. here with Shannon. Hello. How Good are you doing morning. this morning, baby? Happy St. Patrick's Day. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Don't ask me if I'm wearing green. That's okay because none of y'all can pinch me, so I'm not too worried. There you go. <laughs> I know. Hey, You've well. already been pinched at least once this morning. Yeah, well, it's you know, one by a little family rascal. member. Yeah, for real. Which will remain unnamed. <laughs> That's right. Yes. <laughs> hey, we're so excited <laughs> for uh, the day that we've got lined up for you guys. A great experience of worship and a word from Pastor Josh Walters. But uh, first of all, quickly, just want to hit a couple of things. So I don't know yeah. if you've heard the podcast lately, the Seacoast podcast. Man, we've had some really cool episodes lately. We had yes. this awesome comedian on. Uh, we had Andy Andrew on recently talking about her recent book launch. And uh, my favorite a few weeks ago was we had Jack and Jack. So Jack Hoy the second and Jack Hoy the third, affectionately known around here as Jack the Greater and Jack the Lesser. <laughs> but Both are pretty amazing, actually. I'll tell you, these guys probably have a combined IQ of at least 300. Yeah. But uh, talking about, they were talking about AI and the future of America. And all this stuff right up my alley, man. I was really enjoying that episode. But great stuff on the Seacoast podcast. If you haven't checked it out yet, yes. go to seacoast.org slash podcast or look for Seacoast Church wherever you get your podcast from. Absolutely. Pastor Joey is doing an amazing job with for it. For real, for real. So you definitely don't want to miss out on that. Another right. thing that you don't want to miss out on is our Lent devotional. Right. So. We're coming into Easter. For those of you that haven't heard me say this, Easter yeah. is my favorite adult holiday. Yeah. And I just love Lent because mm -hmm. it's a preparation of our hearts yeah. to come in to just really um, appreciate all that Easter is, yeah. right? It's That's not right. just Easter. Mm -hmm. It's not just Easter bunny and Easter eggs, eggs and all of that. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's it really is what Jesus has done for That's us. Right. And so the devotional has so many wonderful pieces of just repentance and fasting and prayer, just mm -hmm. preparation so as good. we move towards uh, this amazing time. So yeah. we'd love for you to check it out. Seacoast.org slash Lent. It's going to get sent directly to your email That's box. Right. So go on, sign up. You may see a wonderful entry <laughs> in there from one of your favorite pastors, um, but it's great. We'd love for you to join us in that. Absolutely. Don't worry. Don't miss out. That's right. you take the time to orient your heart as we head in towards Easter. Well, hey, Pastor yes. Josh is continuing our series today on the life of Joseph, Trials to Triumph. Got an amazing word, and uh, I know it's going to bless you as it's blessed us already this morning. Yeah. So uh, let's ask God to bless our time. Father, thank you so much for your spirit that's with us wherever we are. Everyone watching right now, God, would they encounter you and feel your presence uh, and hear your voice speaking through this word from Pastor Josh today. Inhabit our praises, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, you guys, let's worship together. It's a beautiful day to worship together, right?
Coast. My name is Jenna Surratt, and I serve as the sisterhood pastor here. This week, I was meditating on Isaiah 53. It's a prophetic word about the crucifixion of Jesus. It talks about how he would be beaten and oppressed and rejected. But verse 11 is what really caught my attention. It says, when he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And when we say yes, Lord, like in the song that we just sang, and when we mean it with our hearts, I believe that God is satisfied. So if you came in today with that as your posture, yes, Lord, do what you wanna do. If you would just hold out your hands as a symbolic act of being ready to receive all that God has for you and pray with me. Father, I thank you for every single person that is in this space, those that have said yes, Lord, to even coming in these doors this morning. God, I believe that you have prepared our hearts, that you, that our hearts are holy ground and that you are going to plant seeds that are going to bear beautiful fruit and new life. We commit this morning to you in Jesus' name, amen. Well, happy St. Patrick's Day, everyone. This week, I felt prompted to do a little research on this man who was St. Patrick, and I found out that he was actually born in Britain and kidnapped at 16 years old and taken as a slave into Ireland, served as a shepherd, and after six years of being being enslaved and being a shepherd, this is where he really grew in his relationship with the Lord. He had a dream from God and that he escaped, and he actually escaped after that, went back for 20 years, and then he came back and served as a missionary to the very same people who had enslaved him. And I think that that is just such an incredibly powerful story because St. Patrick's life has so many parallels to the life of Joseph in the Bible. And we are in a series right now about the life of Joseph, and Pastor Josh Walters is going to bring a powerful word this morning. But before he does, why don't you turn, greet someone around you, maybe in your best Irish accent, and grab a seat. There was once a son, the favorite of his father. But he was betrayed by those he loved. He was falsely accused and arrested and left for dead in prison. Through God's power, he was raised to a position of great authority. He forgave his brothers and saved a nation. Through his trials, we see the triumph of God's plan. There's a lot that I love about Team Walters. The chaos, the noise, the fun, lovers of God, people, and all things hip-hop. You know what I'm saying? It's a fun house to call family. But one of the things that frustrates me just about every day is my kids' bags. Somehow they get home from school, don't always know how, but when they do, they get out of the car, Anthem's so excited to run to a buddy's house, hop on his bike and go play, meet some neighborhood friends. He drops his on the sidewalk. Like, doesn't even make it to to the house. His brain stops working when he gets out of the car and sees his bike and his bag's so heavy. I'm like, he's in kindergarten. I know he's just smuggled toys from his bedroom to his classroom to show his buddy he's got something, right? So I I walk inside. Asher's at the place now where he's got a book bag and a sports bag. 
And so a separate bag for his basketball stuff, his arm sleeve. Why you need one of those, I'm not sure. I walk in a little bit farther. Ari's book bag's just about always on the porch. He is so excited to get inside to get a snack that he drops his book bag right there. Come in. Katie and I usually leave ours at the dining room table because we own the house. We can put our stuff where we want to, you know, and that's just where we put it. And I'm also thinking like, do they really need to bring 57 books home after they've been in class all day? I hate to break it to them, but their last name is Walters and their capacity to learn is only so great anyway. Like, do we really need to do all this work at home? And so it's like, by the time I finish going around Adele's bags on the island in the kitchen, it's like, by the time I just pick up all the kids' bags, it looks like I've cleaned up the house, right? And I walk through, it just gets me frustrated. Pick up, who's, uh, you know, I get through the house doing that. I'm like, man, my life would be so much easier if people just did what they said they're going to do. How many times do we got to have this conversation? The living room, the kitchen, the dining room, that's my space. Put your stuff in your space, right? Don't put your stuff in my space. We talked about this yesterday and the day before, right? So that's a part for many snacks, wrappers, cups, shoes, the 57 other things that aren't put where they're supposed to be, right? Well, chances are much like your life and mine, man, if we're not careful, we can go throughout the day and pick up some things along the way that become heavy in time just because people don't do what they said they're going to do. The girls were going out on a girls' night. They were going to call you. We said, hey, we'll call you. They didn't call you. (laughs) Then you saw it on the gram. Hey, there's all my friends. But me, what's up with that, right? Your boss, you've been having conversations about the promotion. You hit all your goals. He didn't say, but he kind of said, like, you do all this, you're going to go to the next step. Well, you didn't go to the next step, right? Picked up some baggage. The contractor you hired to do the job didn't do the full scope of work that he said, and you contracted him to do, right? Wouldn't it be nice if the contractor just did what they said they were going to do? Talk about a miracle, right? It's like we can pick up some things along the way. And if it's big or small, you know, sometimes it's something that defines or redefines your life. Sometimes it's something minor. But if we're honest, sometimes we're the ones who didn't do what we said we were going to do. And we find ourselves frustrated with ourselves, disappointed, again, baggage that we pick up. And the solution to the pain, I mean, this is getting heavy. My shoulders are shaking a little bit. It's like the solution to the to the baggage we carry, the weight that we carry around, whether other people caused it or we caused it ourselves, is forgiveness. Forgiveness is what allows us to drop the pain, drop the baggage we're carrying around today to really take hold of anything and everything that God has for us today. And perhaps the best example of this in Scripture is the life of Joseph. My name is Josh Walters. I'm one of the pastors here at the church, and we've been in a series on Joseph. Man, it's one of the most epic stories, highs and lows, where time and time again, he was mistreated, lied about, enslaved, imprisoned, forgotten. Man, so many moments where the weight he was carrying around due to what other people did to him was so great. Yet somehow, time and time again, he was able to rise above his circumstances, take hold of what God had for him today. Well, forgiveness is unique as a word, because if we were to go around this room and ask everyone here online at a campus, like, hey, what is forgiveness? We would all have our own definition. It's one of those words that conceptually we understand and that we're taught at a young age, right? Anytime a three-year-old takes a toy, we're like, Johnny, say say you're sorry. Say you're sorry. I'm sorry. (laughs) Then the other person, now, what do you say? What do you say? I forgive you. I forgive you. (laughs) I was like... We're conditioned, we're taught to say those words. We know that it's the right thing to do. But man, for any time in your life that you've been hurt, that you pick up some bags, you carry some weight, there can be a huge disconnect between the words that come out of our mouth and the reality about where our hearts actually are. And forgiveness can be this messy road of responsibility and time of reconciling the words that I've said. I'm sorry, I forgive you. Will you forgive me? and actually meaning them or experiencing the fruit of them 
in our heart. I think it's one of those words that's better understood by getting really clear on what it's not. And so to get started today, that's where we're going to go. We're going to look at what forgiveness is not, what forgiveness is, and then the big question that we all wrestle with is how do I do it? So what forgiveness is not? I've got seven points for us. Turn to your neighbor and say, did he just say seven? <laughs> now turn to your other neighbor and say, you got a snack because this is going to be a little while. <laughs> All right. All right. So what forgiveness is not? Number one, forgiveness is not a feeling. Forgiveness is not a feeling. Anytime you've been hurt, betrayed, someone has, has brought about an offense of some kind, right? Your natural inclination isn't a feeling to forgive them. If you're honest, more times than not, it might be a feeling to throat punch them, right? <laughs> Retaliate, let them feel in some way what they've done to you, but it's not a feeling. We don't read in scripture as we look at Joseph's story, how he felt when they threw him into the cistern. But scripture gives us some detail. It didn't have any water in it. After he was thrown in the cistern, his brothers say, well, hey, there, let's not kill him. He is our brother. Here come these Ishmaelites why don't we sell him to them into slavery? Like he's laying in the bottom of a sister and hearing all this. And we don't read that he felt angry. He felt deeply saddened. He felt isolated and alone. We don't know, but he was a man, right? How would you feel laying in the bottom of a sister? Then walking off, sold into slavery, only to be lied about and imprisoned over and over again in these awful circumstances. We don't read about his emotions, but we can read into them. And how would you feel? Yet time and time again, he was able to rise to the top of his <coughs> stories getting me choked up. I'm so sorry. Time and time again, he was able to rise above whatever it was he was walking through to experience the favor of God, experience the blessing of God, because forgiveness is not a feeling. He didn't have to feel like doing it, but he did it. Number two, forgiveness is not a quick, easy and one time action. It's not a quick, easy, and one-time action. We can have a hard conversation with somebody that's hurt us. We can be honest about the way that it made us feel. They can own it. Maybe they ask for your forgiveness and apologize. But for the circumstances it brought about in your life, maybe nothing's changed. And you feel some relief that day, but you wake up the next morning, and the sting of what they did is right there with you again. It can be maddening because you're like, man, we just talked yesterday. We said the words, I felt a little bit better, and here I am today feeling the same way. It reminds me of the verse Jesus says, if anyone will come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Forgiveness is one of those things we take up daily. We have to be reminded that I forgave them yesterday, I forgive them today, so that I can receive your forgiveness. Number three, forgiveness is not dependent on confession. Forgiveness isn't dependent on confession. Genesis 42, 8, it says, although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. Now, why is that? The Bible tells us that Joseph had spent 13 years either as a slave or in prison. And each time he would get in a dark place, he would rise up out of it. It had been a total of 22 years since he had seen his brothers at all. So that they saw him and didn't, didn't recognize him. It makes me question, man, how did Joseph continue to find favor, continue to walk in the blessing of God, continue to have influence and rise above his circumstances without having had a conversation with his brothers? 22 years that he hasn't seen them. And man, so often in our lives, it can be difficult for us to step into today, to move on from whatever pain or baggage we might be carrying because of what something someone did to us so long ago. Maybe they've never owned it. Maybe we've never had to have a conversation or maybe they died and it's never going to be possible. But the real reality is forgiveness is not dependent on a confession. We can move on in freedom. We can experience life today regardless of whether someone confesses or owns up to whatever it is they did to us. Number four, forgiveness is not forgetting the offense or pretending you were not hurt. One of the most Googled phrases when it comes to forgiveness is where is the Bible verse forgive and forget? And it ain't in there. <laughs> That's one of those things we pick up along the way that in some way, when I forgive you, I'm supposed to develop this spiritual amnesia 
right, that, that I don't remember the pain of it anymore. It's true that I'm not supposed to hold it over you. If I really forgive you, I'm not supposed to bring it up again. But the reality of us needing to do this daily, that it's something we don't forget, is in many ways a gift because it reminds me every day. It drives me back to the cross. I need forgiveness as well. God, help me forgive them again today. Help me receive forgiveness from you. In Genesis 45, 4 and 5, when Joseph reveals himself to his brothers, it says this. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother, Joseph. So he reveals himself to them. And the very next thing he says to them is, the one you sold into Egypt, punks, you know, like 22 years, he hadn't seen him, hadn't talked to him. Hey, it's me, Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt, right? He hadn't forgotten, right? He remembers what happened to them, but the sting of it has gone away. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. See, Joseph knew a thing or two about the providence of God, that he works all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And regardless of what other people are going to do to you or have done to you, you are not your own. You were bought at a price. Man, you trust in God. You can let go of that stuff. Forgiveness is not forgetting the offense or pretending you weren't hurt. Genesis 45, 1 and 2, it says, Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants. And he cried out, have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And it says, and he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him and Pharaoh's household heard about it. So for 22 years, he recalled this incident. 22 years, man, he carried the emotion of it that when presented with his brothers, he didn't get teary eyed. He didn't raise his voice. He wept so loudly that everyone outside heard about it. Man, forgiveness is not pretending that you're okay. It's all right when you've been wounded or hurt to show the emotion, to show, man, this really hurt me. Number five, forgiveness is not requiring an agreed upon version of the past. Genesis 45, 26 through 28, this is when the, the brothers, Joseph sends them back to their father to gather all their family and possessions. Picture this scene. The brothers who sold Joseph into slavery return to the father to let him know like, hey, he's alive. Here's what happens. They come to the father. Joseph is still alive. In fact, he's the ruler of all Egypt. Jacob was stunned. He did not believe them. But when they told him everything Joseph had said to them, Israel said, I am convinced. Read that passage and thought like when they told him everything Joseph had said to them. Remember, I'm your brother, Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. <laughs> if I'm Joseph, I'm sending the brothers back and I'm like, hey, guys, we need to talk for just a minute. Poor dad gets here. I just want to make sure we're clear on how this went down. You remember the cistern, the coat of many colors, ripped, faked like I was attacked by an animal, sold into slavery. I just want to hear you say it so that I know what you're going to say, right? Did they really tell him everything Joseph had said? We don't know, right? But we never heard Joseph ask either. Because he had released them, because he had forgiven them, he hadn't forgotten. The pain of it was still there. He still experienced it. But the only way he could have made it time and time again was daily forgiveness, rising up out of that. He did not require an agreed upon version of the past. Number six, forgiveness is not condoning or excusing what the person did to you. Man, so many times I've been hurt by somebody. We've had a conversation and they've said, I'm sorry. And the words that have come out of my mouth were, it's okay. It's not okay. <laughs> it's like, man, when you've been hurt, when you've been wounded, whether it's the small things day by day that add up or the big things in your life. As a believer, it's not a mark of maturity for you to dismiss it or condone it. It's okay for you to be hurt. I'll say things like, it's okay. Or I'll excuse the behavior. Like, you've been so busy. You were traveling. The kids' birthdays. Work's been so stressful. I know you didn't mean it. It's okay for us to sit in discomfort. It's okay for people who love you or who are around you to know that they've hurt you. We don't have to excuse or condone their behavior. 
And number seven, forgiveness is not retrusting or reconciliation. We saw this play out in Joseph's story because sometimes it is. And man, his was an extreme story. I don't, I don't know that I would have been able to go there. We saw Joseph go through this messy process of revealing himself to his brothers by sneaking a cup into a bag, sneaking money into the bag. I think he was wanting to see, like, are they, are they really repentant or are they just afraid and, and wanting food? Right? It was, it was messy, but ultimately he moved his father, all their family, possessions, put them in the most fertile place as Pharaoh had told them to so that they would prosper. In a very real sense, retrusting and reconciliation was part of their story. But man, how many of you know that, that respect is given, but trust is earned? I'm supposed to love you as my brother or sister in Christ. I'm supposed to pray for you, even if you are my enemy. But in no way does that mean I'm supposed to give you proximity or intimacy back into my life. If you've been abused, if you've been hurt, if trust has been broken time and time again, maybe the most unhealthy thing that you could do is retrust and reconcile yet again. Forgiveness does not always mean retrust or reconciliation, which brings the question, well, what is forgiveness then? And man, if you, again, look it up on Google or talk with everyone here, conceptually, we all get it, but we would all come up with similar but really different definitions. And that's what I found. One of my favorites was from a PhD named Alicia Goldstein. She said, forgiveness is giving up all hope of a better past. I just thought, man, that's helpful. That's good. But the best place for us to look, right, is the source. And so looking at scripture, Ephesians 4, 32 says it this way, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ God forgave you. And when you've been hurt and the last thing you feel like doing is being compassionate, your blood boils, you want to raise your voice a little bit, you, you want to talk to a friend about it, being kind and compassionate can be really difficult. But forgive just as Christ God forgave you. Colossians 3.13, bear with each other. I love that language. Because how many of you know, like, man, some people just ain't easy to be around. For me to love you feels like bearing with you. <laughs> it was difficult. There's people in all of our lives like that. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, here's that phrase again, forgive as the Lord forgave you. The example I have to remember every day, just like Joseph had to have for what had been done to him. I've got to forgive others because I receive forgiveness from God. For me to walk in forgiveness today, for me to experience favor today, I have to extend forgiveness to others. Mark eleven twenty five. 25. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your father in heaven may forgive you your sins. Saying, man, in these moments where, where you gather, where you come into the presence of God, search your hearts. Don't get so locked in on your pursuit of him that you don't search your hearts because he say, hey, how you love me is going to be seen in how you love others. And so if you've got beef with somebody, like if there's any grievance, search your heart and humble yourself and go apologize. Forgive as you have been forgiven. It was so important that when teaching the disciples how to pray, Matthew 6, 19, 9 through 13, it says, our father who is in heaven, he's above our circumstances, above our drama, he's above our pain. Hallowed be your name. You are holy. You are sovereign. You are mighty. You are good. Your kingdom come. God, may you establish your kingdom here on earth. May things be done in your will and your ways. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Man, as I walk this earth, as I interact with people, might I be an ambassador of you, do things the way you want them done, love and treat people as you would treat them. Give us today our daily bread. God, meet my needs. You know the food I need, the, the gap in our finances, the health needs and concerns, the places of relational brokenness I experience and walk in. God, give me the things that I need today. And... Forgive us our debts. God, forgive me my sin. The stuff I've done that would separate me from you or keep me from experiencing the life you came to offer as, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And we all have needs. We all struggle with establishing our own kingdom, all these other things. But then why this, this one? 
Forgive us as we have forgiven others. It's an assumption that for me to walk in forgiveness, I'm going to extend forgiveness. And in teaching the disciples how to pray here again, he says, you're going to receive it because you give it. That forgiving others would be something that marks us as believers and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So the big question, again, as believers in a church, conceptually, we understand forgiveness is a discipline. It's part of our faith. It's part of our walk. But how do we do it in small ways and big ways, whether it's caused by others or caused by yourself? Man, we can carry around pain. We read verses like John 10, 10, that he came for me to have life and have it more abundantly. And it feels so far from my reality because of the pain that we carry and experience. So how do we do it? How do we extend forgiveness that we might receive it and walk in the favor of God? I think Joseph gives us one of the most practical pictures in scripture. Genesis 41, 50 and 52, 50 through 52. It says, before the years of famine came, Two sons were born to Joseph by Asenath, daughter of Potiphar, a priest of On. Joseph named his firstborn Manasseh and says, it is because God made me forget all the trouble of my father's household. So his name means God has made me forget all the trouble of my father's household. Well, here he's recalling and naming him this all the trouble of his father's household, right? <laughs> so he hasn't forgotten it. He remembers the pain. But God has dealt with the sting of the pain. He can move forward today with his hands open, with his heart open, because he's extended forgiveness, because God has dealt with his heart. Remember, this is before he's met with his brothers, before conversations, before any kind of reconciliation. Named him Manasseh. It is because God has made me forget all the trouble of my father's household. The second son, he named Ephraim. And says, it is because God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. Well, this is right in the thick of the famine. I want you to go back to 2020 when you had a life and it looked like you going to work and like doing adult things while your kids went to school. But in 2020, y'all were all home together, right? This is a famine in Egypt. Joseph has these two kids, Manasseh and Ephraim. And for any of you that have had a kid in the past, right? A two-year-old, a three-year-old. How many times that? Manasseh, Ephraim, Manasseh, don't touch Ephraim. Don't sit on the couch till we clean your hands. <laughs> you know, like whatever it is, over and over and over. He named his children the most precious things to him. Manasseh, because God has helped him forget all the pain of his past. Ephraim, he's blessed me in the land of my suffering. And practically, what it looked like in his heart. What it looked like in his mind each day was saying, Manasseh, God has helped me forget the pain of my past. Ephraim, he's blessed me in the land of my suffering. Still in this place, I recall the pain. I can feel the memories. I can bust into tears when I see the brothers, right? It's not that I have forgotten, but I have released my debtors. I have dropped the baggage and the pain so that I can be available to hold and take hold of all that God has for me today. I think it's one of the primary reasons that Paul tells us in Philippians 3, 13 and 14. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to take, have taken hold of it as all of us would say the same. This is our struggle with walking this out. But one thing I do, everybody say one thing. One thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. If there's one thing that I do, it's dropping the bags. It's forgetting what is behind and straining. This is the Apostle Paul saying it's the fight of my life to move past the pain that I've experienced, to move past the offense and the things that have been done to me and strain towards what is ahead. I want to take just a moment before we close and speak. I know some of you have experienced something so painful that in many ways it has defined or redefined your life. And when you hear a message on forgiveness, your, your go-to thought can think that in some way that, that if you drop this, if you really forgive, whether or not there's ever been ownership of the offense or conversation of any kind, that you're forfeiting justice, that in some way by you letting go of it, 
the wrong is never going to be righted. And one of my life verses, and I'm going to tell you why in just a minute, comes from a Romans 12, 19. It says, do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. In February, Katie and I shared our marriage story here on a weekend. If you weren't here, you can go back and, and check that out. But we just went through this brutal season in marriage that Katie confessed and everything kind of came to light. And when I had learned about the affair, I was so angry. Not, not with her, but, but with this guy. And I had so much anger towards this guy that I, I would have these violent fantasies of what I would like to do to him, pastorally, how I would lay hands <laughs> on this dude, right? That I, I, would, I would fantasize about it. God, just like, emotionally, I could be driving up the road, fine, and in a moment, I'm envisioning this scene just full of rage and anger. And by God's grace, I knew that as much as I would like to do that, it would be momentary at best. Man, it would feel so good. The bruises might last for a week or two, right? But there would come a point, whether it was that night, the next day, or the next month, that the pain, the anger of what I was experiencing was still there. And it was this verse that God used to say, hey, you can let me carry this and trust that I am just. You can trust that I am good. And whether it's by way of salvation that his life and eternity would be changed and that he would be truly repentant, or if God's going to give him over to the fruit of his ways, right? The wages of sin is death, and there's going to be destruction for the path that he's walking. I didn't have to try to inflict it. I could trust him with it. Well, one day, Katie and I went on a road trip out of town, and we were driving back home, and we pulled off an exit, went through a Starbucks right before they closed, go through, order our drinks, and as we pull up to the window, it's that dude standing there handing me our, our drinks. And I'm telling you immediately, rage just fills my body. Oh, God, I wanted, I, I wanted to throw the drinks back at him. I took hold of the tray and like brought it in the car. Didn't look, pulled off, had to pull over, and I was just shaking, just so mad. So I got out of the car. I walked inside. There wasn't really anybody in there. He was behind the little coffee drink station. I walked up and I said, hey, I don't want you to confuse my silence for weakness because I would love nothing more than to, then I shared a few words <laughs> that I won't share here. <laughs> I said, I would love nothing more to do that, but I won't. And then I quoted him this verse because the verse I've been trusting is that it's God's to revenge. He will repay, says the Lord. So you're not going to have to worry about getting right with me, but you better get right with God. All right? And just left it there with him. And I don't know what pain you're carrying today, but I want you to hear that you are the one that's paying for it. And God's got healing for you. He's got life for you. He's inviting you to drop those bags. You're not going to forget it. You're going to wake up tomorrow and recall the pain. But if you'll do it again tomorrow, if you'll make your hands and your heart available to him, you will see him do more in and through you than you could ask or imagine. You will take possession of the life that he came to offer. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for your patience with us. And we just acknowledge the, the messy path of forgiveness. That we say it, oftentimes not meaning it. That our hearts and minds can often feel so far from feeling the words that we say. But God, I pray that today you would help us be a people that are, are found obedient, even if our flesh wants to say or do something wildly different. God, that we would be a people who forgive as we have been forgiven. And that you, the God who authors all emotion, would soften our hearts, deal with our hearts, comfort us in our pain. Help us day by day, moment by moment, to release the weight, release the baggage, and be open to all that you have for us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, hey, if you're new here to Seacoast, this is my favorite part of every service. We take just a few minutes and ask two questions. God, what are you saying to me? And what am I going to do about it? And for each of us, man, to experience the life that Jesus came to offer, we're going to have to deal with this topic of forgiveness, not just today, but, but every day. And as all those verses read, 
We read, forgive as you have been forgiven. And maybe for some of you today, you haven't really received that forgiveness for yourself. Maybe your next step is to, to go to a cross, to write your name on a sheet of paper. Say, God, I want to receive your forgiveness. I confess my sin. I acknowledge my need for a savior. You can write your name on a sheet of paper and pin it to the cross. For others today, maybe you're going to go and, and light a candle. Because we all know the, the wrestle it is to not just say the words, but to experience the freedom of forgiveness. And you want to light a candle and say, okay, God, by the power of your Holy Spirit, help me to walk this out each day. That I would preach to myself, that I would remind my mind that I have extended forgiveness, that I receive forgiveness, and I want to walk in life. Or you can come and see members of our prayer team. It is my favorite step of response every week. You have to come before another believer in our weakness, the Bible tells us. God's power is made perfect. And anytime you come before someone else vulnerably to say, like, man, this is what I'm walking through. This is what I need. Man, that's a holy moment. Maybe you want to come and, and have someone pray over you in confidence. They don't share anything about it. They'll anoint you with oil, and you can leave having dropped some of the stuff you brought in. We'll have some time to sing and celebrate an awesome God. We can receive communion. We can give of our offerings. But what is he saying to you, and what are you going to do about it? Let's respond together.
favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you in a thousand generations in your family in your children in their children in their children may his favor be upon you in a thousand generations in your family in your children in their children in their children may his presence go before
Man, what an incredible word from Pastor Josh. You know what? I tell you, there's just so much freedom. What's up? Hey, man, hey I, was just just telling, I was just telling. about you. I was just telling people, <laughs> man, we just we just went live, but there's so much freedom locked up in that message Absolutely. for so many people. Just wanted to encourage people. Absolutely. Yes. You know, okay, if you, it's, sorry, you, buddy. you no, good, man. No. You're awesome. Uh, bless the Lord for Pastor Josh and that yes. word. But seriously, if you know someone who could be encouraged by that message, we've got so many more service times this week. Just want to invite you to invite them. Share the message. Share our site. Uh, invite them to come back to live.secos.org. You can hit the schedule tab and see all of our service times uh, for the rest of this week. Um, don't miss this opportunity to bless someone with that word from Pastor Josh. So. Absolutely. Y'all, it's an amazing message on forgiveness. And it he does such a beautiful job of talking about what it is and what it's not. Yeah. You don't yeah. want to miss it. Yeah. It's so powerful. Yes. Um, so wonderful opportunities that we have coming up here at Seacoast That's as right. well. So tonight is custom one night. So if yeah, you've got babe. a middle schooler or a high schooler, yeah then please have them go to YouTube mm -hmm. and you su can subscribe to our custom students, students, custom students channel, um, channel mm -hmm. and um, have them get connected for tonight. It's going to be a great word, blurry lines. They're continuing their, um, continuing series. their series. <laughs> so uh, please, please have them do that yep. as well as we have Easter coming. Come so on. exciting. <laughs> It's my favorite adult holiday, but yeah. it's just, you know, it's such a beautiful, just a beautiful time. And yeah. so we've yeah. got um, Good Friday service coming yes. up on Friday the 29th, 7 yep. o'clock. Yep. Um, Eastern time. Yep. Yeah, Eastern time. <laughs> just helps us to prepare for Sunday. It helps us to remember what Jesus really went through That's on right. that Friday. That's right. Um, and then Saturday, we start with Easter services, mm -hmm. Sunday as well. Yep. Um, so you can go to seacoast.org slash Easter for all of those things. Absolutely. We would love for you to join us. Invite a friend. Come and celebrate with us this year at Absolutely. Easter time. Absolutely. Well said. And so, you know, I just continue to be so blessed and surprised and amazed by how Seacoast is continuing to grow, not just in terms of our campus attendance or whatever, but in terms of our ability to make a difference in the community through our local missions efforts and global missions. And all of that is due to your generosity. So, to those of you who give, thank you so much. And if you would like to contribute to the ministry of Seacoast Church, you can do so by going to seacoast.org slash give or clicking give in our mobile app, which you need to have. We've been talking about it. If you don't have the mobile app, check it out yes. uh, today. But Absolutely. Uh, thank you guys again for worshiping with us this weekend. Let's be dismissed with God's blessing from Ephesians 3.20. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. We'll see you soon.